Hey chickadees, this is Margaret and I am on Taste Life Choice with hot cocoa on this Cyber Sunday, whatever you want to call it. I'm here to chat about something related to nonfiction November, so I'm going to ahead and put that in the title. Um, basically, audiobooks, top 10 list um, of audiobooks like I've read in the last two years. So not the current ones, but recommendations for people who listen to books. Shannon's here. Hello, Shannon. Thanks for coming by. Um, Y'all are on booktube. <laughs> and Courtney's here. Hello, hello. Um, so we can work backwards or we can work forwards in time. What would you like? Let me know. And in the meantime, I'll let you know one cool thing I have coming up is um, December 10th, I have uh, something called 90s Kids as Author Tubers. And this is just a funny idea I had um, because someone had a 90s Kids tag and I thought, oh, I have author friends who should do this with me. So I um, put that in the chat and that's going to be Friday, December 10th, sort of like a holiday mood of uh, sitting around the fire and talking about old memories. What could be nicer? So let's go backwards. Let's go backwards because then I'll have a good chance of starting out with, uh, yeah, 10 to 1. I don't have them ranked in terms of stars because they're all like around the same. They're like between four and five stars. So they're my top 10 recommendations. They're not in any order. So um, let's see. I will go backwards in time. So let's go to our overlays here. And the one that I can barely remember, but I'm always going to remember the feelings that uh, the book gave me is Ben Fountain's Beautiful Country Burn Again. Now this is a very long audiobook. I read this over a month of walking back and forth when I worked at the bookstore and the walk was over an hour. So um, this was a lot of material and what Ben Fountain does, I think he has sports writing in the rest of his resume, is he jumps around in history and talks about events and how they affect uh, or reflect current events. And so there's history and politics and social critique. And I don't see a lot of people talking about this. When I was a bookseller, I didn't see it people I didn't see a lot of people discussing it either. So um, I'm just going to keep putting it up there. My hashtag is queen of books you've never heard of. So hopefully it'll you know get people interested in this. One of the things that was uh, very surprising uh, to me was he had some random anecdote about a politician who started as a salesman going around in Texas. And I thought, no one knows this anymore. Like, But it's a detail you bring out to illustrate the trend. And I just thought it was pretty brilliant and not optimistic, but uh, an enheartening tale for nonfiction. So there we go. Um, yes, we've got Gloria here, a fellow historical fiction reader. Excellent. And Shannon says, yay for 90s kids. <laughs> awesome. All right. So going backwards, what is my next one that I remember? Um, do, do, do. Oh, this one. How many people remember this name, Felicia Day? So I didn't know who this was when I got this audiobook, but it's a memoir slash self help from Felicia Day, who is an actress slash creative producer of stuff. And she's been in um, web based movies as well as TV shows. Anyway, I heard all about this after I read her book. And um, I think she's most she's most known for being in, oh shoot, so I didn't prepare this part. But I, I think she's most known for being in a Buffy episode side character or Supernatural. Supernatural. It's, it's, she's more recent. Um, and she's a good character on that series. But anyway, so here she's talking about... Um, mental health stuff. So that's like the self-help part of it, but also creative stuff and branching out and trying new things and like 
embracing your nerdery. So embrace your weird is how she put it. But I would say like going into your nerdery is how I've definitely heard other people describe this. And I'd say this is a four star, maybe a bit less. Some of the things that she said didn't hit like and land with a big clang. They were just sort of like, okay, that sound, sounds like filler. But there were a lot of moments where she really connected with me. So I would recommend this for people who are looking for that. Her name sounds familiar. Hopefully someone else can put some Felicia Day. Um, Felicia Day tidbits, factoids, trivia in the chat. Yeah. And Pay is here too. Pay is darting all around today, having a, a web day. Um, so hello, hello. Next, we've got uh information doesn't want to be free and if you're continuing in the vein of like sci-fi nerds a sci-fi nerd you'll probably remember cory doctorow's name again these are memoirs that i got on libro.fm and that can't be connected to this is it theater 3000 i don't know <laughs> i don't know but Information Doesn't Want to Be Free is a shorter audiobook. I think it's like five or six hours. And it's his journey through publishing and music and uh, a couple of different industries, but how he first looked at the industry, the decisions he made, what he observed, how he like tracked things. And it, it gets into economics. And so any like psychology of economics in the creative industries, I'm probably thinking of Barrett there, would be really interesting. Um, he had a lot of things that I would stop and I'd be like, wait, he said that very authoritatively, but do I believe it's true based on my previous training? And I had to wrestle with some of the statements and follow the intuitive route and sort of compare. So it was really good for critical thinking as well as reflecting on the industry in which I'm in. Um, information doesn't want to be free. He's talking, uh, let's see, the, the moments I remember the most out of this one was when he was talking about digital rights management and locks on information um, and like the change of technology from DVDs. <laughs> and now we've had our sneeze on the live stream, so we're all good. Um, digital locks and how if you have a lock, that means someone can break into it. So what is the point? And like he has some really good philosophical musings on um, social consequences, economic cons consequences of how we treat information and the internet and our interactions, not the social media side, but the like buying and selling and creating side. So a little different. Um, and it was really interesting to me to listen to. Uh, thank you, Courtney and Felicia Day Theater 3000. Are you saying Mystery Science Theater 3000? Because that's what it rings a bell of for me, but you don't see the people's faces except that guy and the robot. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, information doesn't want to be free. Sounds interesting, says Shannon. Yes, it, it was. And this is like two years old. So, um, and Devin is popping in. Hello, Devin. Live stream uh, coordinator extraordinaire. Very, very good to see you. All right. So that was our number three. We're going to keep going backwards. And I have this one, which I read last Christmas. I remember walking around my parents' neighborhood, uh, listening to this as I was getting some fresh air. Um, so this is by Diana Beresford Kroger to speak for the trees. And this book is, how would we describe this? It's part memoir, part um, nature observations, part history, part, she goes into the Agam alphabet, which is like old Celtic writing. Um, so she is someone who grew up as a, a child of, uh, an English parent and an Irish parent and, um, in the thirties, forties and really had a pretty terrible childhood and was saved by relatives in Ireland from just being forgotten and, and losing, um, her identity. And so she goes back into her Irish family's feeling of responsibility to the land that they had lived in for a long time and the sort of relationship that they had with knowing plants and um, 
like almost druid level of uh, knowledge and wisdom of relationships with everyone in the world, this animal plant mineral. Um, the Lorax as nonfiction. Oh, I like Courtney's suggestion here. Um, you know, to speak for the trees does come from the Lorax, but this title is more like she is, um, so she's in her seventies now or something. And she goes around and takes, um, like tracks species that are going out of that are, that are becoming extinct basically. So like trees and stuff. She lives, I think in Ontario region, but she had a really moving, um, story of going to somewhere in the desert in New Mexico and being called and finding this plant from a helicopter ride on someone's private property and just like being amazed at the good fortune or synchronicity of being able to save certain trees or plants at certain times um, so that, you know, we're not kicking everyone else off our planet and like being trapped here alone to die. That's that's your happy Sunday thought today. Uh, so not the Lorax as nonfiction, but a very interesting account of a bit of memoir, but also like a, a bigger way to combine. Okay, so I told you her childhood and I told her you her like octogenarian ways. In the middle, she talks about how she's been trained as a scientist, but also grew up with this Agam alphabet druid kind of tradition. And so it's how she marries those two and continues to confront people about how you need both sides throughout her career. And so that was really fantastic. So um, I liked listening to her voice. I liked the story and I liked all the knowledge. So yes, yes, Diana Beresford Kroger to speak for the trees. Two enthusiastic thumbs up. The next one I have is Clutter, which I also remember reading while walking around my parents' neighborhood. Um, Shannon says she knows about Agam. That's because Shannon's been researching Celtic mythology and history. And so, yes, um, it's really cool the way she has a, sort of an appendix. Sorry, I'm going back to the other one. She has an appendix at the end where she goes through each of the Agam letters of the their alphabet and how it stands for a tree and like a tale about that tree in legend and then that tree in her life and how she's made a connection with it. And it's like, it's so cool. You would probably like this, Shannon. So there you go. Um, Gloria says, you mentioned remembering what you were doing when you were listening to it. I find that I noticed that too. I remember exactly what I was doing when I look back at the audiobook, similar to songs. Interesting, right? I was going to put together a few questions about audiobook listening um, because I'm combining nonfiction November stuff with audiobook stuff. Um, and I can skip right over the, is audiobook listening really reading? Because yes, you're reading the book. It's just a different experience doing so. But um, if you guys have good audiobook questions that you're curious about other people, such as Gloria's question, I'd love to hear them. So feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, totally. Yeah. All right. So back to Clutter. Sorry. Clutter um, by Jennifer Howard. This is... Oh, another hard one. I, I guess I like reading books, nonfiction books, that are a mishmash of the personal and the factual and not slyly, sneakily so. So when I try to describe um, some of these books, it's a plus to me. It's a positive thing to me when the author has managed to connect uh, things that they've learned or surveys or trends or measurements that they've taken along with their personal learning about how they approach the world or some such thing. So in this one, Jennifer Howard, who I have connected with on Twitter since, and she seems delightful, um, researches uh, sociological trends. She's really into like the Victorian um, garbage heap that have been, heaps that have been excavated um, she talks about a little bit about middens. And so if you've ever done like archeological digs or heard about them or watched them, um, you learn a lot about the material culture of a society by looking at their garbage. <laughs> and so she starts a little bit earlier and talks about the history of clutter. It says an untidy history on the title and, um, how different societies have dealt with stuff. And since it's kind of an epidemic at the moment, um, 
it's useful to go back and think about this stuff. So she has a little bit about her relationship with her mom, uh, and but not a lot. A lot of it is um, previous Victorian stuff, uh, London stuff. There's like different moments that sort of peek out in my memory. Um, the business of clutter, such as the people who come and remove stuff and like the families that are squabbling about it and the sort of richness of life that is lost, but also the ability to cope with life that is surrendered when you embrace clutter. So if you have people in hoarding situations, like some of this will help you understand maybe why, but also encourage you to get help for them. So it's very interesting. It's like a grab bag of different perspectives, different historical periods. Um, and so, yeah, I like that sort of thing. So that's why she's on this list. Katja's here. Read, write, create, saying hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Excellent. Um, feel free to put in your nonfiction November recommendations in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, so that was recommendation number four, I believe. The next one I have, um, so to Gloria's point, this is one I can remember um, getting a little bit teary-eyed at. So when I was reading this, I remember at one point walking up to a hill near my house where I could look out on Portland. And she was describing a similar moment in her book where she was looking out. And this is Lean Out by Tara Henley. She is a radio personality slash producer in Toronto. And so um, she wrote this book when she was like super sick, super exhausted, uh, fed up with life, leaving Toronto to move back to um, Vancouver Island, I think. And so she had a big contrast of like, what is our city life doing to us versus can I live with this different mode of being? So she has really um, an interesting structure to this because she'll start personal anecdotes like, why am I doing this? What is this book about? But then also go into sidelines about, well, why does the city have this problem? Is it inherent to the city or can we um, divest the city from this problem? Um, I remember her talking about housing in in. BC, I think it was the Western side, but it was um, Vancouver. Yes, that's the biggest city in BC, I think. And she's talking about the housing market and how, you know, the people who work there aren't allowed to live there anymore because of housing prices and sort of the interaction of the changing of our values. So if you think about America and gentrification and white flight and the suburb movement and like all these things that come into play and how we're not really deciding, we're sort of being dictated to, or we're being manipulated by some of the demons in our historical worldview, if you follow what I mean. And so talking about this makes it more explicit, makes it more, um, makes it easier to choose, maybe not choose because economic factors are a real thing, but it makes it easier to see why the trends are happening and how when we make a decision we're either part of a trend or we're working against it and it makes it clear what we're actually deciding by and for and if that makes sense if that makes sense for anybody um yeah devin says devin lives near toronto oh okay so basically how crazy the life is um and a little bit of the pandemic, I think, because at the near the end of the book time, she was talking about how she just felt very isolated and um, the protests and like feeling part of a crowd. And there's there's a lot she goes into. Um, and in case you don't know the context of the title, the lean out is um, a response to Sheryl Sandberg's lean in. So the suggestion that women in corporate America specifically um, should lean into the hard, difficult stuff. And that means that like, you're bringing all of yourself to your job. And what Tara is saying is like, if we lean out instead, what we're doing is taking a step back and, and looking at the whole picture of how we're living and actually consciously deciding how we want to be rather than being driven by a, a whip behind a whip hand. Um, 
Katya is commenting, I think based on clutter, you might like a YouTube channel based on cleaning hoarders apartments. Orica Tarlina. Okay, I'll have to look that up. I've never heard of it. But equally, it might be stressful viewing. Depends how you process it all. <laughs> well, the comment on clutter is, personally, um, you can keep decluttering and decluttering and decluttering. You can think you might make a business out of it because you can help other people decluttering um, because it's an emotional process. But then how do you deal with your own that you're not ready to let go of? So it's kind of it's kind of like being a therapist if you're a decluttering person because you've got your ish and then you've got like a different viewpoint on other people's ish. So yeah, it's interesting. Um, Pei says with Katya, I should check out such channels as well. Well said. Charles is here. Devin says Vancouver is the largest. Victoria is the capital city. Okay. All right. I just didn't want to get in trouble with like Vancouver being Vancouver Island and Victoria. Like some people call it Victoria Island accidentally. So I didn't want to get in trouble with that. Uh, Katya says these are extreme though. No, like no cleaning in six years. I'm addicted. Yeah. I just heard that, um, was it Storage Wars where they open up a random storage unit that's been abandoned and try to bet how much they'll get for selling the stuff in it was staged? And I thought, huh, that's a weird thing to stage for a reality show. Like, why would you need to? It's weird. It's a good way to approach life. I feel like I've been my own whip behind me. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. That's another live stream. And then... <laughs> Steph is here. Hey, looking for some great recs. Awesome. So this is, again, for nonfiction November, but since we're almost to the end, these are my recommendations from the last two years, and feel free to put them on your list for next year. Um, or if you have a few days and you're going to be driving, maybe you put them on your list now. So that's my number five, uh, Lean Out by Tara Henley. And uh, so uh, that is about... What do we have next? I think we have six and there's some bonuses. So don't let my top 10 um, lead you astray here. Uh, disposable city. So this is more recent. This is only a few months ago. Disposable city, Miami's future on the shores of climate catastrophe by Mario Alejandro Ariza. And uh, this is great. So I think, I think this was part of that month where I was like, no five stars all year. And then like five star, five star, five star. I had a whole bunch of great reads. I have never been to Miami. Uh, I picked this up because it was a climate catastrophe book because I'm interested in both climate fiction as well as climate nonfiction. And um, he's a reporter. He's got great skills at connecting things. Like once again, my jam for nonfiction is people who can take the political and make it personal and vice versa. And what sticks out in my mind from this book is um, he has urban use, urban planning stuff. He has uh, memes that went crazy online, such as the octopus in the parking lot. So if you don't know, Miami, Florida is built on a lot of limestone. Uh, Florida is built on a lot of limestone. There's swamps, there's um, porous uh, land and whatnot. And so the fact that it's so low lying and the fact that it's such a sponge that it's sitting on geologically means that Miami is one of the cities in trouble for you know the sea level rise problem part of climate change. And so urban planning, um, geology, uh, environmental justice movements, um, people with housing rights fights. Like there's a lot of stuff that comes into play in just looking at one city as a microcosm of all these problems. And the octopus in the parking lot thing was because there's, there's period periodic flooding in Miami and um, it's gotten more and more and more often. And um, there was an octopus that came in from the sea up the channel, up through the, um, whatever it's called, stormwater drainage at the bottom of a parking lot because the parking lot, parking, sorry, parking structure was flooded for like a condo building or something. And it was just hanging out there in the water in the parking garage. <laughs> and someone took a, a video of it, like a 20 second video and it went viral. And so everyone was like, not up in arms, but sort of 
weirded out by this octopus that had decided to come and swim into the city. Um, and so, of course, I had to look it up and it's not much of a video, but that moment of people's eyes being on this like weird thing that is now possible in our new world because we're destroying the water tables and we're destroying the liminal systems like the um, mangroves and the swamps and stuff that used to help regulate the water um, cycle. It's really, really good. He talks about his family. He talks about um, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and like sort of all this culture stuff that comes into being part of this community as well. And so it's like all these different aspects that make me like very interested and remember the things. So those are just a few of the things that stick out in my mind from this book. Very compelling narrator. Um, very compelling story. It's the story of our demise. There's, there's another happy Sunday thought. Um, Devin's saying he, they're a geography nut. Excellent. Shannon saying, I grew up in Miami until Hurricane Andrew took her house away, went back to visit in my 20s, and it was nothing but concrete and buildings. Most of the green was gone. Yeah. Yeah. So the green being gone means that you have no like leaching systems of water into the uh, groundwater aquifer. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yes. Um, Katya is definitely picking up Disposable City. Awesome. I've also talked with um, Mario Alejandro Arisa on Twitter, and he seems very nice as well, like a little harried, but very nice. And um, he's talked to professors and, you know, housing advocates. He had one like fun sting operation where he and his partner were going to look at real estate and they were um, going to different places, sort of like posing. And someone was telling them about the changes in the market, the housing market in Miami based on climate change. And it's just wild, right? So on one level, there's the fascinating fact that the beach properties used to be the expensive ones and the hills like the, I can't, the like favelas in Brazil almost would be the shanty towns and people who had to work in the service industry or retail for the rich folks would be living, you know, a long ways away transport wise. And now it's reversed with a caveat, which is that the higher ground stuff is the place that, oh, now since of, because of sea level rise, this is the place with a nice view and we'll abandon our, our beachfront properties. The caveat being um, the real estate market is still selling beachfront properties because they think, oh, well, it's not over yet. You can still get a few good years out of this before you screw someone else and resell. And it's just like, did you say that out loud? <laughs> um, his sting operation with the real estate professional was because he presents as white. Uh, she treated him, the real estate professional treated him a certain way. He got a phone call and he was speaking Spanish on the phone call and came back and had to confront someone who had made comments about the Latinx population in Miami. And, oh, it's good. It's good. It's good. So I hope you like it, Katya. And anyone else who wants to pick this one up. Yeah. Gloria is saying it sounds like a great read. Devin saying uh, it's on Amazon. But as you may have noted from my thumbnail, I am encouraging people to pick this up on Libro.fm. And here is my banner for that. I still have this banner, right? There we go. Libro.fm is um, a, an audio service, audiobook service where you get, you know, $15 a month and choose a book and you can gift things. And it's got a selection. These are all from Libro.fm. So they're obviously all available there. And it's independent. It helps support indie bookstores. It's a great alternative. I have it on my phone. That's how I listen to these. And um, yeah, the app is great. So feel free to check it out. Libro.fm, the sweetest purveyor of audiobooks in the world. And again, I'm going to ask if anyone gets that reference because no one answered me last time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that was six. We have another one. Recent was Deep Delta Justice. So this one, not really up my alley, but I figured it was a timely topic. I listened a few months ago. This is from Matthew Van Meter. And I cannot read that. Uh, 
subtitle. Sorry, it's too small on my screen. Um, but here's what it's about. Deep Delta Justice is about a time in the 50s and 60s. It starts out with a hurricane, funnily enough, um, when there was one politician who had his particular history of bullying people and like enforcing a white supremacist agenda in the Delta um, in Louisiana, like one of the parishes at the very end of the Mississippi River in Louisiana. And it talks a little bit about the civil rights struggle. It talks about the um, quality of life changes that this boss politician guy uh, changed or made better for some, made worse for others. But the hurricane was like the beginning event of how we meet some of the people who are involved in a lawsuit, as well as the people on the other side of the lawsuit, and how the hurricane affected them. And then how this uh, lawsuit many years later um, sort of brings both of them back into contact. So it's a super strange, like, why choose this moment in history? Why make a book about it now? But that's your girl who loves history in random, random bits. Um, and I think what made it compelling is that the, let's see, the lawsuit was about I'm trying to remember now since like four months ago, the lawsuit was about, I'm gonna have to look this up guys. <laughs> Sorry. All right. I have the tab open. It's not coming to me. So it's like, I got to look it up and bear with me here. All right. Unforgettable story, except for people who read a lot. One lawyer and his defendant who together changed American law during the height of the civil rights era, 1966 in small town, Louisiana, Gary Duncan pulled his car off the road to stop a fight between a group of four white kids and two of his cousins. Uh, after putting his hand on the arm of one of the white children, Duncan was arrested for assault. So it's basically someone who's been picked on, um, uh, profiled and whatever in a small community. And he gets uh, Richard Sobel, a 29-year-old 20 year New Yorker, working that summer in a black firm in New Orleans to represent him. So basically, it's all the things that they had to work through and what life used to be like in the community like this and how they changed um, a specific form of injustice, denial of trial by jury, that, um, you know, as bad as you know that incarceration is right now uh, for Black Americans, Duncan v. Louisiana changed America. And this is like the tale of the the battle. So if you're looking for an optimistic thing, um, an optimistic read that shows that things used to be worse, I don't know, is that optimistic? Then yes, I would recommend this. So good one. This is like not the best, but good, good on my scale. So if that is the flavor you're looking for or the mood you're looking for, that's where I would head. Uh, eight, nine, we've got good economics for hard times. So this is the one, where is it? Do, did I not get an overlay of this one? No, I did. Okay, here we go. So uh, this is from Abhijit Banerjee. And if you're an economics nerd, you know this name from Banerjee and Duflo, who are a famous team of development economists. Development economists are people who work in the developing world or research the developing world to try to boost economic growth, although there's a caveat, and um, help people living in poverty raise themselves up and have um, less problems in their countries. So I studied that in grad school and was intrigued by the name as well as the uh, blurb. Good economics, bad economics, uh, good economics, hard times. So Banerjee in this book is less personal than most of the other recommendations have been. But he talks about assumptions that we often make in economics and things that we take for granted, especially in the U.S. Economic growth is good. Well, things that we've yeeted to the side, such as um, benefits trickle down, which is <laughs> right. Uh, but just examining them in the view of someone who has studied this all his life, but from one angle and looking at it for places like the U.S., where the inequality has grown um, 
And how is that different from when we look at it in developing countries? So to get really nerdy on you, there's something called the Gini coefficient, G-I-N-I, and that measures how much inequality you have in a country. And so it's been, you know, like typical, standard, normalized, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, received wisdom that um, places like Brazil, to bring up Brazil again for some reason, have very high Gini coefficients. Um, Latin America has for a long period of its history, although some countries have broken out of that. But, you know, we have our own billionaire, billionaire problem here at home, um, which gives a different angle on that problem of in, in inequality. So he talks about economic growth and whether it's good, because this is what we've built um, economic policies on for like 100 years. And he comes away going, you can't tell. You can't say it's good or bad. It's There's too many factors. There's the time, there's the people, there's the technology, there's like all these different things mixed in. It's like saying, are green onions good or bad? And it's like, well, are you putting them on a casserole? Are you putting them on a salad? Are you distributing them evenly? Are you cooking them? Are you putting them raw on the top? It's like, there are so, and I just heard about green onions from someone else's live stream. So sorry for that weird example. <laughs> but it's like, you cannot say that economic growth is helpful or not helpful because it's like saying, I, I don't know, the color blue, like, does that help or hurt an outfit? There's another weird example. Okay, I'm just I'm just off the walls today. It's fine. Um, going on till November 30th. I think this is. Oh, look at this. Okay, sorry. I need to catch up on the chat. Sorry, guys. They have a deal right now. If you spend fifteen dollars at an independent bookstore and send them a receipt, they will give you a free audiobook. Yes, thank you. I I knew that. I just didn't connect it with today's stream. So thank you, Gloria. That's much appreciated. So, and Devin is helping me by linking the site in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Going on now until November 30th because yesterday was Small Business Saturday. We all know and love. And then getting back to my discussion of this book and economics, Courtney's with me on the eh, trickle down stuff. Um Someone I was listening to recently was uh, talking about the phrase, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining or something like that. And I'd never heard of that before, like last year. And now I've heard so many variations of it. It's pretty funny. Um, let me move the banner. Oh, no. Let me move this so that you can see the book again. Um, yeah. So there used to be... a trickle down before there was trickle down there was actually something called the horse sparrow is that what it was called I, I mentioned this once before um the same theory but put elsewise and it was just as degrading because basically the idea is that uh if you give rich people money to spend they'll spend it in the economy such that the benefits will shake down to even the, the lowliest among us right and the way the first person talked about this and like Gilded Age Edwardian era, so like 1890 and 1910, he had, I don't remember his name, his name doesn't need to be remembered, but he uh, advocated this because it was like, you feed the horse and the horse poops, and then the sparrow in the street actually picks out what it needs from the, the manure. And I thought, yeah, that's that's about right, right. Um, Devin says blue is her favorite color, and Shannon agrees. I mean, I, I like, I like the blue. I do like the blue. Um, and I've got, got blue all over here, but, uh, you know, context, context is important is my point. Judge Judy says that all the time. Don't piss on my leg. <laughs> I can't say I'm a fan of Judge Judy, but here, sure. We'll take it. We'll take it. Um, I think that was nine. And the last one is a uh, recent read, I think uh, two months ago, I guess, is uh, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. And this is a shorter read. This is only like six hours, I think. Um, and Other Arguments for Economic Independence by Kristen R. Godsey. So this book I was turned on to by my friends, uh, I think it was... Is it Brittany of 
literarily smitten and Rosie, Rosie Cockshut. I think it was one or both of them. No, it was Rosie and Amrita and having the, having a discussion about this. And I, I came late to the table. So I remember being in the chat and making comments, but I was not, I had not read this with them. So I was behind the gang. Um, but this is a, a person who writes about uh, socialism because she's been in, let's see. Whoa, let, hold on. Checking here. Um, I'm trying to remember why. No. So her sources are the people who have lived under socialism. She, I think, um, mainly American based and studied this and wrote about it and then has made her career about this. So this work is an expanded version of um, an article she wrote. So kind of like crying in H Mart, you have a essay you write and then you get more and more feedback. And so you write more and more about it. She did research, uh, with writers, um, who were living behind the iron curtain and a lot of stuff. So if you think about feminism and if you think about all the, uh, social quality of life factors, she does, um, analysis on uh, both qualitative and quantitative surveys and also throws in her own interesting things, uh, stories about um, comparing, I don't know, family paid leave, for example, and stuff like that. So I'd say this is really good for our discussions of current policy possibilities, um, especially talking about Build Back Better happening or happening, happening. Um, and she's very humorous. She's very, um, she's got lots of pathos. So I, it was a really interesting read and definitely recommend. Um, Shannon says, definitely a catchy title. That's how you got to get people somehow, right? <laughs> um, so there, I think that is number 10. But then here are my, <coughs> didn't make it to the list, but are the most recent. So, <coughs> Um, oh, doo -doo -doo -doo. second to most recent is square hunting. And this was, oh, Katie reads and rants. Okay. Thank you, Katya. Katya, Katya's on, on the ball here. Rosie, Amrita, and Katie w had the discussion about this. It was really good. And Marilyn is here. Hello, Marilyn. Um, so second to last book, Square Hunting by Francesca Wade. This is five writers in London between the wars. And as I have mentioned this before, um, the book was sort of sketchy. It's kind of like a short story collection and that you're examining lives and like a slice of life of five different writers connected or chosen because they all lived in the same, uh, bougie book nerd neighborhood, Mecklenburg Square in between the wars. So some very close to World War I and some like during World War II. So a good 20 year span. And they are classics scholars. They are economic historians. They are literary writers. They are poets. They are, I think that's the, the gamut, um, mystery writers, Dorothy L. Sayers. So there's a broad spectrum and mainly it was examining the growth of these writers and the influence that their times had on them and that they had on the publishing world and a little bit their neighborhood. So I really liked this. We had a really good discussion, uh, a few weeks ago and it was so fun. Beth Ann is in the Patreon book club and she, um, she was at a wedding that day, but she had so much to say and was so interested by this book that she got into her car and like got on the Zoom with us for like 45 minutes of the hour and then went back to the wedding. <laughs> so that was a, a big vote of confidence. So if you are if you are pulled in by that, definitely, definitely try this. Um, yeah, so for historical people, it's a nonfiction about women writing and changing the literary world, taking it by storm. It's pretty, some of the stories are sad, um, but if you see me on Twitter, I have Eileen Power Fan Club President in my Twitter title now because I had never heard of her before and now I'm anxious to learn more about her. So um, haven't acted on that yet. It's only been a few weeks, but uh, yeah, something I really liked and other people also really enjoyed. And let's see if I'm together enough to have this on a 
banner? Probably not. It's been that kind of month. Oh, I still have it. There we go. So if you're interested in the Patreon book club, the next book we're doing for December is The Library Book by Susan Orlean. And we do every other month is a book discussion. And every month, it, every other other month is a just bookish chat. And I have a guest on the channel and that's public because there's only a few of us at this point. So I feel like sharing. Um, but that is the link. It's, it's on my about page if anyone's interested. Um, and December, December 19th, Sunday, we do a, like a third Sunday or something. So that is, um, when we'll be discussing the library book for book lovers everywhere. All right. And then my last bonus, my last overlay here is going to be what I read for this nonfiction November which I just mentioned briefly, and that is Unreconciled by Jesse Wente. So hands up if anyone's heard of Jesse Wente, first of all, because we have a couple Canadians in the, uh, in the chat. Marilyn is telling us the library book is fabulous. Excellent. I've been looking forward to it all year because when I planned out the books for the book club, I was like, this is going to be a feel good book. I want to make this the December read. So I've been waiting, <laughs> waiting and waiting. Um, and then Pay says, I will definitely have to look up square hunting. I haven't heard of this one at all. That sounds like something I would really like. Yeah, I think it's a year old or two maybe. Um, so, you know, niche circle a bit, as I understand. Um, Courtney says, square hunting has gotten a lot of praise around BookTube. Seems like a crowd pleaser. Well, so Roz uh, of Scally Dandling about the books definitely talked about this a few times because I remember commenting about it and she buddy read it with at least one other person. I can't remember who at the moment, maybe Katya knows. Um, but I think she had a, there were pluses and minuses. And I think definitely the structure of the book is a little piecemeal. And so like a short story collection, you're going to like some of it and you're going to be like, mm, this doesn't call to my soul, like classics, whatever. Um, and that's fine. That's, that's the nature of a survey really. So I'm, I'm okay with that. And I really appreciate the pieces that I did get introduced to so that I can follow up with more on, um, uh, tidbit for that one, just to be weird. I really liked the fact, um, now I'm going to forget her name. The person who is, let me just go back and look it up because you're all friends and you're <laughs> kind um, square hunting. Uh, Jane Harrison. There we go. I cannot remember her life, her name for the life of me. For some reason, it just does not stick. Jane Harrison was the earliest of the five writers and she's a classics scholar. So she did all this research on like Greek and Roman, um, and like ancient other non-Western societies that were matriarchies and sort of made all these theories that sort of upset the, uh, the men in the Oxbridge community. And that's totally not my thing. I don't really care about ancient history, mostly. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not sorry. But what she had to do because she couldn't get a teaching position because no one would give her a chance in the academic realm was lead tours around the British Museum that pointed out things she had learned and like brought the past to life. And I was like, oh yes, please. Yes, yes, please. So there's like a little bit of theater in a classic scholar's history. So that sort of detail was like really uplifting and inspiring. And I liked that. So, But yeah, fair point, Courtney. Um, not all feel good. Yeah. And Kati doesn't know. She can't save me this time. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, if you know Roz, you can definitely look up her channel and just search for square hunting because she'll, she'll have given credit to whoever she was buddy reading with. Okay, but the last one, Unreconciled Family, Truth, and Indigenous Resistance with Jesse Wente. Uh, so no one has said that they've heard of him, um, but he's a pretty well-known film critic in Canada. And I obviously I wouldn't know this. I'm not into film critics and I don't live in Canada. So there we go. But what he did was talk about um, talk about how he grew up, how he learned about discrimination 
and then really sort of expand on the indigenous resistance movement in his industry. So it's not too long. I think it was like 11 hours and I you know, shortened it a little bit by listening at 1.2, which is all I can do. But he um, went through some of the key events in um, Canadian indigenous relations and why there's like a deep memory of uh, trauma and Oh, one of the things that sticks out in my mind about this one is his um, his moment when he sees his kids going back to visit their reservation where some of their family live and his kids saying that they want to live there all the time. It's so fun. They love running around with their cousins. And he had this like heart heart turning. It's not heartbreaking. It's not heartwarming. It's somewhere in between because it's a complicated feeling. Because he remembers his grandmother's stories about going to residential schools and how demoralizing, degrading, alienating um, that was for her and her culture. And um, and then he sees his kid running back around and feeling safe and feeling taken up in that culture. And he says, so they went to all that effort, the, the people, the RCMP, the... Um, it's not called Bureau of Indian Affairs. I forget what it's called in, in Canada, but the equivalent went to all that effort of stealing children, tricking parents into taking children away, um, imprisoning parents who wouldn't let their children go, like all these horrifying things um, to introduce the residential school movement, which tried to take all the culture of Native First Nations peoples away from them so that they would assimilate. And he says, in that moment, I understood that all they got was a couple generations. They got my grandmother, they got my parents, and and I I'm not I'm affected by the trauma, but I am not like afraid of reclaiming my heritage, he says. And so I just thought, whew, yeah, that's there's still discussions going on, obviously, about this. The residential schools are still in the news. They're finding graveyards. There's a lot of current stuff about this, but he really goes into his family's experience of it, his understanding of the traumatic history and how um, he decides to interact with it, how his politics and his interest industry have reflected this and how he has chosen to do X or Y and Y. And so I thought that was really, really cool. So, um, yeah, Jesse Wente. I have heard of him now and I would recommend this. This is a new one. So this is like within the last couple of months. Um, so yeah. Got Mina Ruth. Hello. Nice to see you here in the chat. She says that's ha sad how the Native American children were treated in those residential schools. Yeah. And I I haven't rewatched this movie, but there's a um a movie that came out in 1989 called I think it's called Where the Spirit Lives. And of course it's American, but um, one of the things that you, one of the things that I gained an understanding of this nonfiction November is from this book where he goes between the Great Lakes, south of the Great Lakes and back up to the north. So he goes between Canada and the US pretty seamlessly, like several times because of his family ties. Um, and the other book I read, which is A Mind Spread Out on the Ground, there's a similar sort of indigenous tradition of going back and forth because of the systems and how they were chopped up with nationalism and whatnot. But um, I remember watching uh, Where the Spirit Lives in 1989, an American representation of residential schools and how that was just burned into my memory. Um, the kids getting taken away by helicopter, not helicopter, um, bush plane, the plane that lands on water. I can't remember what they're called. Um, and, you know, hair chopped off, abused um, physically if they were trying to speak their language, separated from their siblings, like all this stuff. So to learn about that is um, important to understanding why things are they are how they are now. So that's a win for nonfiction November and expanding um, truth in history to people who have not lived it. So I really appreciated that. And you'll hear more about the mind spread out on the ground by Alicia Elliott in my November wrap up next Sunday, I guess. So yeah. Whew. 
So we're ending on a on a great note, <laughs> a sad note, but a really good book note. So I'd recommend this as well. So that's like 12. I guess my top 10 have, have 12. Um, and I don't know. I heard some people saying that they're going to pick up this or that book, which is very exciting. I'll just remind y'all um, to please check out Libro.fm. As Gloria told us and Devin put in the link, um, they have a, a book deal right now where you buy one $15 book and you get an audiobook free. So you're supporting an indie bookseller once by buying the book, and then you're supporting another indie bookstore when you log in and start a Libro.fm um, account. And they are great. If you think about Amazon as like a faceless void of, of machine parts and AI, Libro.fm is the antithesis of that. They're like a very small crew and they answer all your customer service questions like by email personally and they just are doing good things. So yay, Libro.fm. And that's why I have such a you know great relationship with them for my channel and recommend them all the time. Seaplane. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Marilyn. Yeah, she got it. Okay. Seaplane. Thank you. The seaplane. Um, I remember there's just like scenes that stand out and that are burned into your memory. You know, Courtney says, thanks for all the recs. Excellent. Allison's just signing on saying she's late. That's totally fine. Um, hope you enjoy if you read any of these books or if you have any of them on your shelves, or if you choose any of them for your free Libro book, come back and let me know in the comments. That would be really cool. Saying aloha. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thanks for the Rex Disposable City now on my TBR. Awesome. Um, that is that is all for us today. What will you be listening to next? Uh, I said at the beginning that I have the 90s kids as author tuber um, thing coming up on December 10th. And the only other thing that I would share is I've got a productivity sprint this Friday and I have been lucky to have some of y'all show up in the productivity sprints and read or write or, I don't know, wash dishes, whatever you're going to do. And then we can have little chats in between, which is super fun. So I'd love to see you on Friday. I think it's noon to two Pacific time is my usual time. But thanks, everybody. I hope you had a good weekend, whether it was filled with turkey and stuffing or not, or tofurkey and stuffing. I hope you had a good time with your family and um, have had a good nonfiction November because the point of nonfiction November is learning about the world. And on my channel, you always get a glimpse into the truth and history part. So I hope that's a flavor that appeals. And um, I guess I will talk to you guys again soon. <laughs>